Welcome to We Are DB. I am Brenton, joined as always by Danielle. That's me. Thanks for joining us again this week as we count up the IMDb's best movies of all time and discuss some of the greatest films you mightn't ever have seen. This week, rated at 26 on the Internet Movie Database by millions of film lovers from around the world, is Saving Private Ryan. Released in 1998, starring Tom Hanks and Matt Damon, Saving Private Ryan is a war film set mostly throughout Nazi-occupied France, opening at the assault on Omaha Beach during the invasion on Normandy toward the end of World War II. Based on an original screenplay by Robert Rodeau, Saving Private Ryan is produced and directed by Steven Spielberg. Now, I think this one's going to go a bit longer because I've got a lot to say. I love this movie. I've seen this a lot, up to ten times. So I was asking you last night when we were watching this, Spielberg's done quite a few war movies, hasn't he? Yes, he's done at least half a dozen. And I really do feel like because of his ethnic background and probably experiences that his family has had um, with World War II and the Holocaust and just everything related with that. The Jewish community, yeah. Yeah, I think being part of the Jewish community lends him a really unique and powerful perspective to do war films because it would be that much closer to the heart. So I'm not trying to say like, well, of course he does good war films because he's Jewish. I'm just saying I think it helps. You know what I mean? And we spoke about that when we covered Schindler's List in episode six, which I recommend going to listen to. the most amazing job with that. And the same things that made that a great movie made this a great movie. I think we're going to be pulling a lot of comparisons to that film. Yeah. Within both, he paid such attention to little details and he doesn't like shine a huge spotlight on them and be like, look at this. But it's like, oh, I never thought of that before. Same with the brutality in in both of them. He yeah. shows the necessary brutality without, again, shining the spotlight on it. It's just, this is what happened. You need to be aware of it. Yeah, and that's the thing is that he's able to portray those elements, so the small details that wouldn't usually have a light shone on them, and just the things that would have occurred every day. He shows both of those just as that, without any excessive attention given to them, and I think that that is what makes him a really fabulous, fabulous director, especially when it comes to his dramas and his war dramas. This was only five years after Schindler's List. So he basically, like, he did a couple of things in between, but he basically just went straight on to working on his next project. Like, he must have just gone through this period where he was just very passionate on it. Um, I'm trying to mm-hmm. think of other war movies that he's done. There was one in the 80s called 1941, um, but it wasn't very good. And that was in a period of time when he was doing things like Jaws and Indiana Jones, E.T., Color Purple. He couldn't really do anything wrong in the 80s, except he had this one film in there that no one's really heard of. Uh, Mm. And it was a war film, so apparently it wasn't very good. Um, But yeah, he's very good at doing those. Yeah. Well, I would say, honestly, Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan are two of the best movies of all time. Yes. Especially, well, that's why it's it's on the list. Well, and not even just as war movies, just as movies, period, full stop. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what would be in the discussion of the best war movies of all time. I haven't seen... Things like Full Metal Jacket or Apocalypse Now, I think they would be in the discussion. Empire of the Sun would be up Which, there again, too. is Sp- Spielberg. That's another one. Um, yeah. I knew there was another one I was missing. I think there's another one similar to that. Uh, you haven't seen Empire of the Sun, have you? No, I haven't. I was thinking I about doing it for an honorable mention. We need, we need to watch it. I've seen it a few times. Um, and it just it's so interesting because instead of being in Europe, this one's in Japan. And it looks at it from a totally, totally unique, different perspective. I like that. Um, Yeah, so I reckon you'd really like it. We need to watch it. I don't want to spoil it. I think there was a movie uh, a few years ago now, probably about 10 years ago, directed by Clint Eastwood, produced Mm -hmm. by Steven Spielberg, called Letters from Iwo Jima. And it's a similar uh, sort of take on it, where it's a Japanese film. It's Japanese spoken, but it's directed by Clint Eastwood. Um, Hmm. And apparently it's very good as well. Uh, I would like to look into that for doing an honorable mention as well, but I don't really know that much about it. Um, We'll look into it more. 
Very mm. good war movies. Um, and Full Metal Jacket and Apocalypse Now by uh, Stanley Kubrick and Francis Ford Coppola are both in the top 100, so we'll get to those in the coming months. War movies present a really interesting opportunity, I think, for directors because you can approach them from a few different angles. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Like you, you can approach them from the battlefront or the strategic because even... The Imitation Game is technically a war movie. Yep. Totally different. You know what I mean? But you don't see any fighting or anything there. No. Well, and there's a lot of TV series around that. I think there's this one that's about the Canadian spy unit. And they okay. go in. I'm pretty sure they're in Europe and they're doing intelligence. So you can go from that angle. Or Bletchley Circle is about the women who worked at the facility where Alan Turing worked. So they were doing intelligence and code breaking um but their husbands and families thought they were just making uniforms and stuff so it presents a really interesting opportunity to tell a huge array of stories from a huge array of perspectives it's because it was such a pivotal event particularly the second world war so much was going on at the same time and it led to so much that's why you've got these opportunities for so many different stories to come out of this one event it's mm -hmm. really interesting to see all these different sides I really would love to see a movie told from the German perspective. Yeah, and I was talking about that. that movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Yep. Which I it's I think it's like a 7 out of 10 on the IMDb. So it's like, eh, it's okay, it's pretty good. Um, and that is primarily told from the German side. It was about the Germans who were trying to assassinate Hitler from the inside. And that was a perspective that I'd never seen before. Even and they're all then English speaking. <gasps> Well, and no accents. That's the thing that kind of bugged me. Is like, yeah, it was a little strange. Try and... A lot of English actors playing Germans in that movie. I would like to see something from the Nazi perspective. Yes. So what I'm saying is you're pro-Hitler. I'm not... Okay. Like, just to see that perspective represented, because even though society has for so long now, what is it, 70 years, 80 years now, been saying that it's so wrong... It's still a perspective that a lot of people had because they were brainwashed into thinking that that was the right perspective. Yeah, that would be an interesting take. I'd love to see something where it's like, you, you know, you're fighting, basically saving Private Ryan, but from the German side. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Because I've never seen that before. And it's still a story. And history is always told by the victor, but I would love to see it told by the loser. Yeah, especially when... People forget that not everyone who was um, on the German side agreed with Hitler. They were just following orders just like the Americans were or the, the Allied and forces. Even within Downton Abbey, there was an instance of one character dying during World War I. And they found out how he died is that he was shot for cowardice. And he was an English soldier. He got shell shock and froze and wouldn't go to battle and got shot. And that's how he died in the war. Was that World War I? When when's yes. that show set? World War One. Okay. So it's just it's just interesting because there's so many perspectives that you could come at this from. You know what I mean? Like to think that all German soldiers were these horrible, horrible people. It's not. They were brainwashed. A lot of a lot of these young people and these young men within the ranks of the German army really thought they were doing what was right. Or once they realized they weren't, they were shit scared because they would be shot. And that was something that even happened within Allied forces. Yeah. If you didn't fall in line, you'd be shot. So it, nobody's perfect and nobody's totally blameless. You know what I mean? Surely there's a movie out there that covers that side. And if someone can recommend that, I would really love to see it. Um, just to Same. see that extra side. Uh, yeah, that's always been a touchy subject, looking at Nazis or, or from the Nazi perspective. Because... There was even an auction in Australia, I think it was in Perth, Australia, like a month ago, where they were auctioning off um, old war memorabilia and artifacts. Some of them had uh, SWAT stickers on them, they were German uh, war memorabilia. And there was protesters saying that they were in support of Nazis and white supremacy and all this shit. The guy who was selling it's just like, it's a part of history, what are you talking about? This is just artifacts. I'm just selling both sides of the thing. I'm not supporting anything. This is ridiculous. And it was ridiculous, well, yeah. but that just shows how touchy of a subject it is with people. Or just having, like, even... There are 110% museums that have 
Nazi, and SS war uniforms, because how else do you think that all of these movies have accurate costuming departments? Yeah. That's not supporting Nazi Germany. That's keeping an accurate record of history, which I think is so important, so that you know what actually happened. Yeah. Um, to get back to the movie? Yes. Okay. There's a lot around this. This is something where, like, like we said, it's a very heavy, multifaceted topic. So if we go off track, that's kind of just part of the beast here. And Spielberg brings it out. He brings up these discussions, the, the subjects which we will get into more later, and particularly in the spoilers. He makes you think about these things or shows you sides of the war that you hadn't really, like, oh, I hadn't thought of that or hadn't really seen that depicted in film before. And it's really quite brilliant. Yes. Particularly around the Holocaust and Schindler's List. There was a lot of things in there that I learned about the Holocaust from watching it. It plays almost like a, a documentary. Um, it's by a It really so does. It's, it's yeah. very accurate if you look into it. Um, mm. I kind of appreciate that. This movie is very much your typical Oscar bait, quote unquote, where you've got so many big name actors. There's so many actors in this. You've got... Tom Hanks and Matt Damon, obviously. You've got uh, even Brian Cranston's got a small role. Ted Danson, mm. Nathan Fillion, uh, Tom Sizemore, Edward Burns, uh, Vin Diesel. You've got Giovanni Ribisi. There's a lot of people in this. There's mm. um, big Oscar winners. You've got someone like Steven Spielberg directing the subject matter. John Williams is doing the score. So some people are like, I don't think those movies that are clearly trying to get Oscars should get them just because they're trying so hard. And I don't think that it's trying so hard. I think it still deserved Best Picture that year. I was going to say... It lost out to Shakespeare in Love. Ugh. Ugh. Which I've seen Shakespeare in Love, and it's fine, but it's no Saving Private Ryan. I the fucking love this movie. I have with that is that, okay, yeah, this is Oscar bait, but you wouldn't have created the powerful story that was necessary to tell this story. Like, you wouldn't have had all of the essential elements to properly tell the story without having all those people and all of those elements. Like, I'm very much someone who's like, it is a disservice to make a shitty war movie. Yeah. Like, like it's not okay to make a shitty war movie. You make a good war movie or you don't make it because it's, like, any other way it's disrespectful, I find. I'd really like you know to I mean? see your take on Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards because he does an approach that's different from any other war movie that I've seen. And uh, I won't go into that, <laughs> but it, it's different. And um, his perspective on it, he also brings up things that you hadn't really seen in film before or makes you mm. question things like, oh, how'd this, how did this work? I never really thought of that before. Um, mm. And I like films that do that and make you think. Mm. To talk around the movie a little bit more. And talking about, you know, war movies should be respectful and things. I've always been someone who is very anxious. Um, and I get really uncomfortable quite quickly, especially with some of the things, like some of the content in this movie. It's very graphic. Um, however, specifically with war movies, I make a point of making myself sit through this. Because I say to myself, whatever discomfort I'm going through watching this movie in the comfort of my own home is nothing compared to what those men actually went through. Or those people. You know yeah, I mean? when did so, we discuss that last? Probably the last time we watched this. No, I feel like we've discussed it on the podcast. I'm trying to think. Maybe Schindler's um, List? Maybe. The point being, I had a really, really hard time watching this a second time. Um, I just want to emphasize... I think this is a fantastic movie. I think it is a hugely important movie. I think it's a movie everyone should see. All that said, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to watch this again. I said the same thing about Schindler's List when we did the episode on that. I think it's a fantastic film, but I wouldn't ever want to watch it again. I watched it twice purely because of the the podcast, um, but I love Saving Private Ryan. There's some moments in here. There's real human moments yes. uh, where it's not all just brutal war parts and the parts that are focused on the war battles and things, they're done in a very good way. There are moments in this that really make you think about what was it like to be in the shoes of those men, not when fighting, but just like how how did being there change them? So in particular, you see a lot of strong masculine men in this movie break down and cry. And I think to myself, 
That must have become something that was very normal to see and that you just you just let it happen and you don't make fun of people because mm. people are consistently losing people. People are consistently, you know, making friends and forming these really strong, intimate bonds with people that you would only get from, you know, fighting for your life beside somebody and then they lose that person. So I'm just thinking, like, it kind of challenged and happily challenged some of the views I think society presents about masculinity because I think a lot of these characters before the war would have seen any expressions of emotion, intense emotion like that as weakness, whereas being in the war, they found it to be necessity and not only is it something that like that everyone goes through, it's something that you allow them to go through because you completely understand where they're coming from. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's something where I sat back and I was like, huh. Because I, I actually watched, there's, a, there's quite a few times where you see men crying and not just like little tears, like properly breaking down crying. Well, that's completely and fair I, enough. Oh, absolutely. I'm I don't just think anyone's thinking, going to judge them for that. No. Is that what and you're that's, saying? Yeah, that's the point is that you all have this understanding of what it is you went through. And I just, I've seen other instances in other shows that were about or around the war where the women, like the wives or the girlfriends or whatever, once they come back home, they see this emotional side of these men that they've never seen before, husbands, brothers, fathers, whatever, and they don't understand it. So I think it would have been so important to have groups of men who were friends or who went through the same thing to support each other because nobody else would really understand it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. I was going to ask you, do you think that this is Steven Spielberg's last great film? Well, I don't know. I don't know when his stuff came out, so... So this was 98, um, mm. and since then he's done AI, artificial intelligence... It was kind of messy because it started as a Kubrick movie and ended as a Spielberg movie. That's weird. Um, yeah, it's a little weird. He did Minority Report, which I think is all right. Some people love that movie, but I'm like, eh. Catch Me If You Can, I think is one of my favorite movies of all time. That but was a very good movie. Yeah, and I think that's rated 8.1 or 8.2 on the IMDb. Mm -hmm. So some people consider it great. That could be his last one. Um, and he's done so-so movies since then, really. he's done, He did War of the Worlds, which I quite like, but... A lot of people don't. Um, and then he, since then, he's done like Indiana Jones. He's got a lot of producer credits. War Horse, uh, Lincoln, Bridge of Spies. He recently did The Post and Ready Player One, which are all like, they're, they're good. They're fine. Um, but for the last hard hitter. This one was fantastic, though. Yeah. Yeah, probably. It was fantastic. I'd argue for Catch Me If You Can, because I fucking love that movie. Um, but... Yeah, to have such a big message and to really rattle the cages the way this movie did. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say that this is the last one. Yeah. He's working on West Side Story as his next movie. Righto. I made a joke a few episodes ago about how there's like four music composers for movies in working in Hollywood in the last like four decades mm. uh, as a joke, but I'm thinking about it now. This is episode 26 and... Out of those 26, two of them have been Hans Zimmer, four of them have been John Williams, four of them have been Ennio Morricone, and five of them have been Howard Shaw. Like, there's literally, like, four guys working in Hollywood. And if you include, like, someone like Danny Elfman or Michael Giacchino, um, Alan Silvestri, apart from those, there's basically, like, eight to ten tops music composers For movies. who Hollywood constantly just drags they're like i like your feeling i like your style i need you for my movie and they just keep being reused over and over again they're the greats in movie composing for original scores well yeah, yeah. um it's just interesting that since like 1980 or 75 it's been like the same guys mm. uh working on these things interesting for sure a lot of people wonder if this movie is a true story and i don't think it is specifically but the concept of trying to save someone because they've lost their brothers is is a real thing. And I yes. believe these missions happened in World War II. Um, I don't know if they were as dramatic and as long as this one yeah. is. Uh, the reason why it's set up this way in this movie is because so many things go wrong. They lose his troop and they don't know where he is. Um, so that leads to the drama, which could have absolutely happened mm. in the war. So it's not based on a true story, but the concept is. This definitely happened more than once to somebody in some capacity. The idea that um, yeah. 
he's the last one in his family, so they need to go bring him home so that that family doesn't lose all their sons. That definitely happened. There's a guy in this that a lot of people think is Ben Affleck. You even said, isn't Ben Affleck in Saving Private Ryan? And Who I said, is no, that that's guy? Else. His name's Edward Burns, um, and he really hasn't been in anything else other than, like, romantic comedies and chick flicks since then. He's just been in shitty movies since then. Well, that sucks. Uh, but he really does look like Ben Affleck, doesn't he? He's a good actor, and he's really he's, he's good, good looking. He's good in this. And yeah. that's unfortunate. Yeah, he does look a lot like Ben Affleck. Particularly when he's in this Matt Damon movie straight after Matt Damon and Ben Affleck won the Oscar for Goodwill Hunting mm. <laughs> the year before. Mm. Um, side note on that, skipping to the end, all the other actors, particularly of these troops, had to go through boot camp to get ready for the film, mm -hmm. while Matt Damon got out of doing boot camp because he was traveling around promoting Goodwill Hunting. So that added an extra layer of these actors hating this pretty boy for going around uh, on the red carpet and things while they were in boot camp, and it made them really hate Ryan's character even more by the end of it, mm. and I think that was a really nice touch. It added to it. So, and I mean, I think Spielberg probably saw that, and he was like, no, no, you go, you go promote your movie. Like, he, yeah, like, he was like, no, that's okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, he was playing into it. Directors have been known to do those sort of things to invoke real emotions in their actors. Mm. And I think as long as you're not crossing any boundaries, which people have done in the past, uh, it can lead to some really awesome scenes. Yeah. I'm ready to kind of dive into it a bit more if you are. I think it, we'll get into spoilers now. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk about that opening scene. Like, obviously, the opening scenes usually aren't spoiler heavy. But I just wanted to talk about the accuracy and the, the detail of that scene. I think the storming of Omaha Beach um, in American war history is such a pivotal moment, and they lost so many people. And this scene shows probably one of the best depictions of it in cinema ever. It shows so many elements of it. You've got the guy who's walking around holding his limb. There's a guy holding his intestines in. There's flamethrowers. There's just the, the, the water is all red. I think that's a nice touch. Even... The thing that got me, because the first time I ever saw this scene was actually in a, like, making of the movie, behind the scenes documentary thing. Oh, that's documentary on Yeah, Spielberg? and so I didn't realize what it was, and I was just like, what the fuck? Like, I didn't realize it was Spielberg, I didn't realize it was Saving Private Ryan. I just remember thinking, that is the most immersive war scene I have ever seen in my life. Because right from the very beginning... One of the first things you see is a guy, they're in these amphibious vehicles, and he leans his head over the side and pukes his guts out. And I mean, of course you would be. You're rocking all over in the water. You're nervous as all shit. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. Of course you would see that. And then when a lot of them got off that boat, they drowned because of the amount of equipment they were on them, let alone getting shot or anything. Pretty fucked up situation. The thing for me that was the most, like, one of the best details of that entire scene was when the camera would go under the water and you would stop hearing all the sound. Yeah. So that, for yeah. me, I was like, whoa. Like, that was such a fantastic, fantastic directorial choice because it's like, I feel what these guys feel. So immersed, because yeah. And you got to remember, I have anxiety. Like, I have hardcore anxiety. So sitting there... With all this noise and this change of, like, noise and guns and then nothing, and noise and guns and then nothing. It's hugely jarring for me. And so that adds again to my perception and sensation of this scene, because it's just like, holy crap, like, this is so chaotic and scary. And the cameras, it's very immersive shots, so it's a lot of, like, jiggling around, and there's some, like running with the camera, and then there's some... There's a lot of action scenes throughout this whole movie that they they intentionally use that shaky cam where you've clearly got a cameraman running along with the actors, and I love that because it makes you feel immersive. It makes you feel like one of the group. It's done very strategically, and I think it's so important. So, so, so important. That's what makes Spielberg yeah. fucking terrific, is things like that. I think that. it's so important in war movies in particular because... To me, the whole purpose of a battlefield scene is to make you attempt to understand what these people went through. And this is mm. probably, you know what? This is by far the best example that I've ever seen. The only movie that I think, and I know people hate it, that comes close to depicting what the trenches were like is Passchendaele. Which I, I don't know what that is. It's a Canadian film. Kind of okay. similar. <laughs> 
I th- I'm pretty sure he actually showed this to World War II vets who stormed Omaha mm-hmm. Beach, which is horrifying if you think about it. Um, but they were like, yeah, that's it. You could not be any more accurate. That is absolutely what it was like. You may as well have the camera on the beach right then because that's exactly what we went through. Um, and I think that is very powerful. That's a great like seal of approval, basically. Um, one of the first depictions I ever saw of any war really was video games. Mm. I actually learned a lot about the war through video games, what they did and the weapons they used and how they went about it. There was a video game series in the early 2000s called Medal of Honor. It was sort of like Call of Duty. Um, I ran alongside it. Yeah. Uh, and there was an installment of that called Medal of Honor Frontline. And the very first level of that is basically the very first opening scene of Saving Private Ryan. It goes through it and it's so detailed. You have to like go between these big anchor points as well and do very similar things that's in this. And it was years later that I realized that Steven Spielberg created the Medal of Honor video game series and he was the producer on that. So Mm. I thought that was really interesting. He basically uh, helped create that opening scene in the video game as well to try and enhance what he did in Saving Private Ryan. (laughs) And that was my first instance of... A lot of war elements. Like your first introduction. Seeing these scenes, yeah. yeah. Hmm. He's got his fingers in a lot of things. I think he's, he yeah. also started DreamWorks Pictures. Yeah. Which is why this is a DreamWorks movie. And Amblin Productions. Yeah. He's, he's a billionaire because of it. <laughs> because of all the business deals he's in. Um, I just think that's probably one of the most amazing opening scenes of any movie. It makes this movie. It's so intense. Um, yeah. Because what I really appreciate about it is that it throws you right into it. It doesn't ease you in because what do you think, especially some of these really young boys who faked their age to get drafted, they weren't eased into the war. They went through basic and then they were thrown into this. You know what I mean? Yeah. It makes you feel like one of these guys who it's just like, bam, now you're in it. Yeah. Deal with it. Yeah. That's an interesting point. I hadn't really thought of that before. Like like Mm. I say, I take war movies really, 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 really seriously and- He's done an amazing job. I can't express how how important it is to me that war movies are done so like so properly. I need to stop talking about yeah. that. <laughs> um, Straight after that, there's a scene where Vin Diesel's character actually finds a Hitler youth knife and he hands it to the Jewish character and he starts crying. What does that mean exactly? So do you know what I, that is? Did the Hitler like recruit? Kids okay, or so what the Hitler Youth was was basically the youth faction of the Nazi Party. So you know, like Boy Scouts and and Girl Guides and stuff are like a, okay. a children's kind of organization for kids to be involved and do things. But political parties don't usually have a children's organization. No, but you have to remember that Nazi Germany was huge, 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 huge on propaganda. They yeah. Um, Start with them young. <laughs> they changed school curricula and, like, kindergarten storybooks to include stories about evil Jews with huge noses. Like, See, I would actually love to see a movie that focused on that. Yeah. Even though it is obviously offensive, it's part of history. Yeah. And I would love to see more of that because I haven't seen... I don't know much about that. So what the Hitler Youth was is that there were various levels of these children's organizations that you would graduate through. So you'd start in Boy Scouts, and then I think it was the Young Men's League, and then at age 14, you'd become a member of the Hitler Youth, and there was, I think, the Young Maidens League for girls. And what it was was just a social club for kids, but it was run by the Nazi party, so just to propagandize them and prep them to become, for boys, it was part of the military, so I'd imagine it was a mixture of, like, Boy Scouts and Cadets kind of thing. Um, and for women, it would have been a lot like Girl Guides. So for the girls, they were prepped f- to be domestic housewives. Um, so that Hitler youth knife, I'm trying to interpret the scene. Why would that affect him because more than anything? it's a symbol of the fact that these children are being taught to hate Jews. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can see that. Like, that's my interpretation of that scene. Like, why would it affect him so, so badly? Does that mean that the guy who Vin Diesel pulls that knife off is underage? Or he's still holding onto the knife when he was part of this? Because they wouldn't have sent underage kids to war, would they, on the Nazi no, side? No, but they they would have sent them directly from Hitler Youth Once at they age turn 18, 18 into yeah, okay. the army. So they would have just yeah. still had the knife on him. Yeah. Okay. And what's really interesting that I didn't even realize is that that knife is what kills that character. 
Oh, it Isn't so that crazy? is. I've seen this so yeah. many times. I never picked because up on that. Because he pulls it out and then it gets turned on him. Fuck, Steven Spielberg is terrific at those sort of yes. subtle symbols, isn't he? Yes. Which is, that was a fucking intense death scene. Oh my God. Well. It's so personable because shooting someone from a distance is not personable. That's another thing that I think this movie does so fantastically because you think of war and you learn about the war at school and you just think about people standing on way opposite sides of a field shooting at each other and then you see them fall down. Yeah. And that's, when I was younger, that's how I interpreted war. You don't think about people wrestling on the ground, slicing each other's throats open. I think that was more for World War I, maybe, when they were shooting across the trenches. There was a no man's land, but World War Two was like, they were deep in All each other's pockets. Off. Yeah. Yeah. And I could just be naive in, in saying that, but that's how I envisioned it more. But when I realized that that's what happened to that character, I forget what his name was, the Jewish character. I was just like, holy yeah, I fuck. Forget. I quite like that actor as well. Yeah. He used to be in a lot. But that's a slap right in now. the face. Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? Like, wow. But just little details like that. Go Spielberg. There's so many little interesting character development traits in here to make you really mm. feel for the character and Spielberg didn't have to do that they didn't have to add these things in there and I really love that he did um, and that's an example of that but you were talking about the Giovanni Rubisi character he's the medic for the group and he was talking yep. when he was in the church about his how his mum used to be an intern at the hospital so she, she was yep. probably a nurse or a doctor and that's probably why he was a medic. And I think that's such an interesting trait to read into that character as to yeah. why, what are his motivations? You know what I mean? That interest is there because of his family and what their background is. Yeah. Um, and that's such a nice character thing to add in there. It's awesome. Yeah. And again, that whole scene where he's talking about, I don't know why I wouldn't wake up and talk to my mom. Because his thing was he'd wait for his mom to come home from the hospital and no matter how hard he tried to stay awake he'd fall asleep and then he said then on the night she was home early i'd pretend i was sleeping and he said i don't know why i ever did that and i hate those those guilt moments because he dies not long after that you know yeah yeah i love those little human moments those those quiet times of character dialogue in that scene you also yes. see the start of hanks shaking his hand that was present right from the beginning, from oh, the very it? opening scene. Oh, it is yeah. too. Yeah, it is too. Um, yeah. That's where he explains, he highlights it basically and, and says yes. that his hand is shaking and you can't really stop it. And you were saying that that's probably a trait of withdrawal from alcohol. So that shines a light into his character more. Yeah. He said it started however long ago. Probably what it started as, you know, is that he was just so shaken literally at the core um by what he's been seeing he's drinking to help him get through it mm. but you'd reach a point where you'd have to keep drinking to function and that's what alcoholism is shakes are very common for alcoholics to go through if they haven't had their drink for the day yeah and that's something i hadn't really picked up on until you yeah. explained that it's just, it was interesting to me too, because there's another scene near the end where the young kid, the young corporal, who they pick up because he speaks German and French, up him. he's talking about how he didn't take his ration of cigarettes because he didn't smoke. And then he's talking about like, he didn't know how he would be doing it without it now. Alcohol and cigarettes, I can absolutely 100% understand why the army would be giving soldiers cigarettes. Yeah. Because that little hit of nicotine is going to do what you need to calm you down in those moments. Cigarettes you know would I mean? be a lot easier to transport and things as well. Than liquor. Yeah. Um, and they're not intoxicating either. So even though yes. liquor would be helpful, it's like it will lower your coordination and things like that. Whereas the cigarettes wouldn't. They'd make you on edge and a little bit jittery. But that could actually be a good thing. I imagine they're given out for similar reasons for why they were given out in the American prison system, because it was a way for them to sort of relax and have this this thing to help them cope with their situation. Mm. But it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't make them intoxicated. It doesn't bring out aggression. Um, and it doesn't go off or anything. You know what I mean? Uh, it doesn't, mm. doesn't go bad. So yeah, it's a nice little character thing. And another another character trait that I like towards the end of that is when Matt Damon's talking to Tom Hanks about his brothers. It's about the last mm -hmm. time that he ever saw them together. Did you know that that mm -hmm. whole scene was improvised? 
Really? Matt Damon just sat down with Tom Hanks. There was a few lines, obviously, between them where he's asking them um, about it being a teacher and he says, my brothers were always like we were always real shit around. to my teachers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Tom Hanks is like, we had a thousand kids like you. Like, he's just like, you little shit. Um, yeah. And then Matt Damon goes on to that story about his brothers. And I just, every time I watch that scene, I'm looking at the little things in Matt Damon. And he, like I said, he was a recent Oscar winner for storytelling. He got it for um, writing, Google Hunting. So that's just showing how good this guy is, not only as an actor, but as a storyteller. And that's why Tom mm. Hanks' character is just sitting there staring at him because he doesn't have anything to say. He doesn't really know how to react. He's listening to it for the first time. And I think that's such as a... As he would have been. Exactly. That's yeah. such a crucial character development moment because without that yeah. scene, you've just gone through France to find this character and he's just sort of running around alongside Tom Hanks at the climax and that's it. You don't really have this human moment with him. You don't get it. It's very shallow. But adding that in there gets you to see more into this character of Ryan, makes you feel for him more. It's like, oh, you know, he really loved his brothers. And I think it's just such a brilliant thing to add in there and it was all on Matt Damon. Yeah. I I think it's interesting too. So he came up with that, like he didn't have any scripting or anything for that maybe in the script spielberg just wrote like riff with tom hanks's character okay you know talk about your experiences or something and then go for it because that's what usually these improv sections of movies are it just has a line in there saying talk about this in general nothing specific because the line i fucking love is that this girl, she fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's so clever just to come up with on the spot. I've always loved that line. When he's telling that story, he looks like someone remembering a moment. So maybe he was, yeah. maybe he had something in his in his life that he was remembering back to when he was describing yeah. the barn and this, this situation and he's talking about how his brother's reacting to Dan or whatever his brother's name was. Um, he looks like he's remembering and he's like wiping his face because he comes to the realization that that was the last time he was with his brothers. Um, he looks off into the distance like someone remembering. I think that's, I love that mm. scene. It's one of the best mm. parts. And knowing that it's improvised makes it so much more uh, impactful. It's so much more impressive. Yeah. To me. Yeah. Why do you think Tom Hanks' character didn't want to say that he was a teacher? Because the only time he actually does end up saying that he's a teacher and explaining to people is when he thinks that he's going to die. He eventually gives out and says, what if we don't live that long? I'm going to tell you now, sort of thing. It was when the medic died is when he ended up telling them. Why do you think he was holding on to that for so long? Maybe he wanted to create an illusion of this higher... I don't know. Yeah, because I think... People don't respect teachers? Yeah, like, it's not like he's some like leader or mayor or like really high up authority figure like certainly he's smart enough but all of these kids like he'd have just been teaching them it's not like it was a policeman or something yeah you know what i mean and i feel like he kind of felt that he needed to create an illusion and they're like oh well if you're not telling us it must be something yeah you know what i mean um and that kind of gave him the power that he needed to do the job that he needed to do. I like that. Yeah. This is a a question that I didn't didn't really understand. Would you immediately be put into a certain rank depending on what your real life occupation was? Like, say you were a policeman, would you immediately become captain or something? Like, he's a teacher. How does he become captain? The only sort of resources I have to go off to answer that question is MASH. Okay. Um, And so doctors were immediately put into officer ranking positions because they were educated. Okay, I can see that. So the lowest rank that a doctor would have is a captain. Interesting. And then servicemen would work their way up. So you could be just a soldier and work your way up that high. Yeah, I'm saying because when they were drafted, you get put in these slots. Um, Mm. I'm just wondering how they decide that. Probably partially based on your experience and based on your education. Like, a lot of nurses, again, MASH, were lieutenants. Um, Mm. There was one nurse, she was the head nurse, she was a major, and that's because she was an army brat, and she had grown up within the army, and so understood how it worked, and she'd worked her way up to that rank, but she would have been a higher rank anyway than, say, a private or a corporal, even though she was a woman. So, I think there was a certain amount of 
if you're educated, you get higher up. If you were higher class, you'd often get higher ranking as well. Okay. That's interesting. Especially in World War One. Yeah. Because, again, higher class, likelihood of better, more education. Yep. Right? So. And you don't want dumb fucks high up running the show. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, yeah, it's just interesting to look look into that. Uh, going back to the character development, I really love the character played by Barry Pepper. Uh, he's the sniper of the group, mm. and the way he goes about it is different to the rest of the characters. He meticulously prays, basically, and he has a different mm. approach to it. And I kind of, I kind of really like that character because he's very humble, even though he's brilliant at what he does. He's very good at it, but he doesn't enjoy it because it's obviously war. He's so Texan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see you that. You know what I mean? Like, but it's how he's able to compartmentalize it. Yeah. And again, you see that between John and Mike, so the captain, Tom Hanks' character, and his second in command there. Yeah. He's saying, you know, you rationalize it, you lose one to save 10 or 20. Yeah. I love um, that scene as well, where he's where he's rationalizing yeah. that. I just think that character from Barry Pepper, if I were drafted into the war, I would be someone very similar to that. Because that's the characters that I used to play in the video games. I would try and like rationalize this and be like very strategic and accurate about it rather than just going guns blazing sort of thing well that's the thing is that you're doing only what needs to be done yeah you know what i mean he barely wastes a bullet yeah like there's another moment right in the beginning where the guy says don't shoot let him burn i yeah. feel like a character like him he is not going to unnecessarily let people suffer he's going to do his job yeah and he's going to do it well. You know what I mean? Because that again, too, it just shows like, fuck, like these guys hated each other. And that's like... The Let Him Burn scene was right after Omaha Beach. The amount of people that those guys killed, yeah. which is why th they said Let Him Burn. Yeah. Um, which is kind of fair enough, even though it's like very brutal, particularly in, in that moment. I just, I always sit back after watching something like this and, and I say to myself, what a waste. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Just because... Yeah, nothing really comes out of war. No. And you hear stories about how you have a ceasefire for Christmas and one British unit, they'd go and they'd be playing soccer with the German unit on the other side of the trenches. During I know the they ceasefire. did that during uh, World War One on No Man's Land. Yeah. Uh, on Christmas Day, they went and played a game of football. And then you turn around the next and day, go kill yeah. each other. It just shows like what, what the fuck's the point of any of it? That's my point, right? It's like... Like, if you can turn around and do that, what the hell is the point? And that's the thing for me where... They just fall in orders, yeah. Well, yeah. And for me, it's so hard. Like like I say, the reason why it's so important to me that these movies are taken so seriously is because it was such, it was such a colossal loss of life. And people fought so hard. Like, you owe them your respect. However... What what was the point? You know what I mean? Like, if you can turn around and be friends with each other for five minutes and then go back to killing each other five minutes later again, like, it's just, it just, it makes no sense to now me. Now that I think about it, this movie actually shows whenever someone is killing someone unnecessarily or brutally, it's immediately after they've done just as bad. If you've got a character in this, either side, who is just going about his day-to-day -day job or clearly is, like, merciful, then they'll spare them. It's just after mm -hmm. when you've just done something, like the whole let him burn thing. I'm thinking about why Upham shoots the guy at the end. He did yeah. something. Uh, or the guy who spares Upham on the stairs. Upham's clearly not a threat to him, so yeah. he spares him. It's, it's honestly, you see these more inhumane acts straight after they've done something inhumane. And I yeah. think that's kind of important because if you're just following orders, I'm I'm more willing to spare you, I guess, even though I might have a hatred for the Nazi regime or whatever. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Also, yeah. question, is the guy who spared him on the stairs the same guy that Upham let go at the beginning uh, when no. at the thing? He looks so much like him, though, and it's always been confusing. I kind of wish that he was. because. Broader. That would be an interesting character trait where he's like, you yeah. spared me, I'm going to spare you. Um, but I do think it was more of just, this guy's clearly not a threat, I'm going to leave him alone. Yeah. 
and then Upham does see the guy at the end, which is what confused me, because I'm like, well, he was there, so maybe that was him on the stairs. No, it wasn't him. They just had the same fucking haircut, and <laughs> it looked very much like him. Um, yeah. I actually love that moment at the end when he does kill that guy, because the <sighs> he shoots him, and you don't see anything. You hear it, and you're looking at Upham. You're looking at the, mm-hmm. his facial expressions. It's probably the first guy he's ever killed. And he he means it. He's like, fuck you. I tried to do you the nice thing. And he's staring straight through him. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's such an important scene to have in there, particularly for that character. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I really love that. Mm. I'm just thinking back to when, when Upham was being nice to him. The guy's like trying to dig his own grave, right? They, they're forcing him to dig his own grave. And then he starts singing... The American National Anthem. Yes. And as someone who has never been in the military, who is not American, that always enrages me. If I were one of those guys, I would fucking punch him in the face so hard. I think that is so disrespectful for this Nazi Mm -hmm. guy who has just killed his medic, standing in a grave, singing your National Anthem. Fuck you. I would rip him to shreds just for doing that. It enrages me as someone who's not even connected to this scene. Mm Mm-hmm. In any way. I think it's yeah. so disrespectful. Like, more than anything, I'm like, oh, shut your dirty mouth. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it so much. And I love that Spielberg's mm. able to bring that out of me. Um, going off that scene, this movie, particularly when we first watched it, we had a few conversations. I never really understood what a war crime was. Um, mm. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean you can't just kill him? Because Upham was saying it's a war crime. And I'm like, there's no rules in war. World War II proves that. This, this things that are depicted in this movie proves that. Um, and at mm-hmm. the beginning of this, you've got two German guys surrendering and they've got their hands up and the guys just straight up shoot them and laugh at them. And yeah. technically, that's a war crime, isn't it? Yeah, because they've surrendered. Right. So I thought, there's, there's, no, there's no rules in war. There are lots of rules. I, d- I had no idea. I had no yeah. idea. And this movie was the first time I ever asked that question. I'm like, what are you talking about? The Germans did whatever the fuck they wanted behind the lines or in front of it you know what i mean like they did Mm. whatever and obviously that was a subject of a lot of things the trials at nuremberg obviously um a lot of the high-ranking german officials got justice for their war crimes but i don't know there's there's a lot of questions around those sort of things as even today as to what what's considered a war crime because there's some things that happen even today from either side, oh, that could absolutely. definitely be classed as war crimes. And I'm like, what are you talking? There's rules in war. No one abides by them. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, a little bit. Now? Let's just touch it. Okay. Just a, just a little caress. You had to go there. A war crime is an act that constitutes a serious violation of the laws of war that gives rise to individual criminal responsibility. See, I was under the impression that this is World War Two, man. I'm on the front line. Anything goes. Keep yourself alive and your men and by any means. You know what I mean? I I had no idea that there was there was specific rules in war. That's so that's such a strange concept if you think about it, particularly after you've seen these things. It's like you can't torture your prisoners like you have to. Yeah, because that never happens. Yeah, but you're not supposed to. Yeah. You See, that's my I point. Mean? People do these things, even today, even though you're not supposed to. So they're kind of like rough guidelines that no one actually follows. I don't know. That's what it seems like to me. Uh... Yeah. I, uh, quick question. This could be very controversial. Um, yes. The movie Zero Dark Thirty accurately depicts when the Navy SEALs went and killed Bin Laden. Mm-hmm. They show torture. They put their military units in someone's house in Pakistan. Like, they crashed their helicopter into his yard, went in and killed this old guy and his family in his sleep. How is that not a war crime? Why was that celebrated so much? I understand it's Bin Laden and he was the one behind 9-11 and all that shit, but it's like, how is that not a war crime? You're just as bad as him. I don't know. And also, I don't know, were they at war? They weren't at war with Pakistan or Al Qaeda. I mean, they'd, I they'd know. been through a lot of shit with Al Qaeda. I'm just gonna read off the list of war crimes perpetrated by Germany. Okay, here we okay? go. All right, 
So, participation in a common plan of conspiracy for the accomplishment of crimes against peace, planning, initiating, and waging war of aggression and other crimes against peace. So this is against the country of Germany. Yeah, these were perpetrated by Germany. Um, My question is just that they're not on a human level. It's a, it's a state level. Yeah, I'm confused. Okay. Atrocities against enemy combatants or conventional crimes committed by military units. So, see, that's so weird because then where does murder start? Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. What, what part of it is like, oh, I'm killing this guy because our main goal is to win the war. Or I'm killing this guy because... It's murder. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Do you see why it's a little cloudy for me? And I'd like to see yeah. an example. Maybe I should watch the um, Trials at Nuremberg because that came out not long after the war. I believe it was a film that depicted those or even watch a documentary on it. I'm not very educated on it is my point. And getting an education from films isn't always the best solution. <laughs> There's war crimes and then they were charged also with crimes against humanity the major one being the Holocaust. Obviously. was a crime against humanity, and then some of the other things that they did surrounding the Holocaust, including, like, death marches, widespread slave labor. How do you ever have justice for that? Because the worst thing you can do to someone is death, death right? But that's not really justice for the fucking Holocaust. I know we've gone on a tangent here, but it's an interesting discussion. I don't know. Yeah. There's certain things, okay, we're really going on a tangent here. There's certain things where it's like, don't kill the person, lock them up for the rest of their God-given lives with very little for them. Like, How does get... that make you any better than them? And it's costing they you resources. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's I a, don't know. It's a very, yeah. very cloudy subject. I can see why. Yeah. There's some questions around it. Going back to the movie, I want to talk a bit more about what it would be like to be in war. Okay. Um, there's things where it's like you'd be so uncomfortable all the time. Yeah, I was talking about um, how you'd never have toilet paper to take a shit. <laughs> well, you'd never have toilet paper. Like, you'd always smell bad. You wouldn't be able to brush your teeth. If you're in the trenches, your feet would always be wet. And yeah. that's why your feet always start to freaking rot right off. Um, you're always dirty. You never have anything nice to sleep on. I can't imagine always being on the edge of dying. Yeah. Like, if you let your guard down, you die. I can't imagine that. Yeah. I can't freaking play paintball for my anxiety. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I couldn't imagine this. I was going to ask, do you think that it was safer to stay in a church? Because they're in this fucked up village in France, and they sleep in a church for the night. Were the Nazis any more compassionate when it came to like preserving medieval churches and stuff or they didn't give a shit was it safer to stay in a church i think so i think well that was a an ally held area and that might have just honestly been one of the more intact buildings just by no chance. i understand that but i'm, I'm yeah. i was just made me ask the question like you're not supposed to bomb hospitals are you not supposed something to like that churches, yeah kind of thing maybe maybe I also just remember, like, like this This gave a lot of context, too, to what the terrain was made to look like. Because a lot of other war movies I'd seen, you just see those skeletons of towns. Mm. Like, you see a building, and it's like you can see all three floors in the building because one wall is all that's left standing kind yeah. of thing. You know what I mean? And you can see that each apartment was painted a different color and stuff. And I just appreciated that that they moved around a fair bit so you got to see like bases and drops and they're waiting for the medical unit in the middle of a field somewhere. And then you know what I mean? Like they move around a yeah, lot. Yeah, you get to see the different contexts. Yeah, okay. Because in a lot of other scenes in tv shows or movies you generally see each of these like settings one set yeah in isolation from each other you know because you'll do a hard cut to somewhere yeah. else and it's like this one was a lot more organic in the flow of how things moved and how units moved that i haven't seen portrayed before like like i said i really want to understand what it was like because for me then I can have more compassion and more empathy because I understand it. Mm. You know what I mean? And so I appreciate that he put in the effort to make sure that it was conveyed really well. 
I wonder how difficult it was for set design because they had to build that set of all the rubble towards the end of this film. You basically would have had to have built a miniature French village and then literally drop bombs on it to make it look this good. It looks so realistic and organic. It feels like an old French village that's been bombed and they made it completely for the movie. Well, I just think it's very impressive. You wonder too, because like just to take a wrecking ball to it, wouldn't rubble do this. wouldn't fall yeah. the same way. That's my point. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. They they could have done explosives. It's probably behind the scenes or something that I haven't seen, so <laughs> maybe I'll look mm. into it. I always feel for the moment when they're driving to go tell the mother, Mother Ryan. Mm-hmm. I think that's a brilliant scene because there's no there's no dialogue. You can tell exactly what's happening and what she's feeling without really needing it. And that makes me want to root for this group. I want to get Ryan out of there as well when you see that. It's a very it's a very heartfelt moment. It's an important one. And you feel that even more than he does because initially he's like, well, I don't want to go. You know, like, why do I? And it's just, it's a, it's a strange moment, you know, because Hank says, well, what are we supposed to tell your mother? And he's like, well, tell her that I died gloriously or something. I'm like, that's not going to make her feel any better, dickhead. You know what I mean? Like, and it's so strange too because I've never understood what the appeal was because you had teenagers lining up left, right, and center to get their fake IDs so that they could go to war. Why? Do you, as a young male, have any insight into why it would have been such a... Like, why would you want to go? I know for the First World War, it was definitely... These sort of people, even ones from small country towns, they never really got the opportunity to do anything with their lives or see the world. And this was an opportunity for you to go to all these countries, these exotic places. They went and trained in Egypt and um, they went to Turkey and Italy and France. Um, So there was an opportunity there to see the world and create this kinship. And you learn all these valuable skills and discipline, these lifelong skills, these lifelong relationships. It was it was a once in a lifetime opportunity and I can definitely see the appeal. And by the time World War II came along, the people who were being drafted, they were the sons of the people who went before. They could see how heroic it was. It was a status that was put on a podium that said, if you're not up there, you're left at home with the housewives and the mothers and you were kind of less of a man, I guess. So it was such a high level of honor to go represent your country. And we watched Captain America recently, and you can see that character. He also feels that way. He's exaggerated, obviously, because he's Captain America. Um, but th- it's based on something. I just... You don't see I've the appeal. Always, well, no, it's just I see that, but I'm like, but as soon as you get there, like... Did you not have any idea what you were getting into? World War II, definitely not. It was a fucked up place that no one could could have really seen. Like, did you not realize that you were going to kill people who were also trying to kill you? Like, did you not realize that there's a high likelihood and probability that you're going to die in a really slow and painful way? Yeah, but it was a me or them kind of situation. If I don't go, they could be on home soil. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and the yeah. people who were going around the country signing people up, they were pitching this propaganda without showing those sort of graphic things. They were showing yeah. off the benefits of it all um, and making people want to go and showing them the values of it all. So maybe they didn't realize. You probably wouldn't have seen scenes from the battlefront back on home soil. Mm. I just want to say I realize the privilege I have in being able to say these questions i've always had this like and i don't understand where it comes from either but this huge respect for people in the military that said i would never want to be in your shoes you also see this in that mel gibson movie hacksaw ridge have you seen that no it's a true story and the premise is an interesting one it's a guy who went to world war ii but he was a very religious person and he never fired a gun and he won the the Medal of Valor, I think it was. He won a high high ranking um, award for what he did there, and it's depicted in the movie. But that's an interesting premise. Like he never even fired a weapon in basic training, and he was still put on the front line. And they said, if you don't do the basic training, 
then you don't get to go to war. That's it. Stay at home. And it was such a such an insult to suggest to this person that you have to stay home. And he's like, no, I want to, I want to serve my country. I want this. But I don't want to kill anyone. I don't want to fire a weapon because it's against my religion. So it's a really interesting perspective. He's probably one of the only mm. people in both wars combined who didn't do that. Well, how do you stay alive? Uh, he was using his wits, I guess. He was a medic. So he okay. would he would support people and get people out of there and help save them that way rather than okay. being a fighter himself. Mm. Um, but you also see this trait of wanting to go to war even though you're against war. Um, it was definitely held mm. in high regard if you were lucky enough, quote unquote, to go to war. It was such a privilege, mm. really. Um, it's an interesting thing. I'd, that that movie's all right. It's fine. It's not held up there with the rest of Mel Gibson movies, but I think it's it shows that side of the character in a very cool way. I had never really heard of that pre- premise before. Yeah, it's a perspective I've never encountered that I'd really like to see. Yeah, because I'm just I'm I'm always open to seeing a different perspective, and I mean, if you disagree with it, cool. If you agree with it, cool. But that's like- mostly an Australian movie too. There's probably like two or three. Americans in that and everyone else in the cast is Australian. Interesting. Yeah. Australian unit or American unit? I think it's an American unit. They're all playing Americans. Huh. Yeah. And the main guy is American and he's English. (laughs) Andrew Garfield. Huh. That's pretty much all I have to say about this movie. Aside from the cast, like I thought I thought Tom Hanks was why I love Tom Hanks and I think Matt Damon was great in this as well. I also like how they were so able to keep Ryan's identity under wraps until it was absolutely necessary. Yeah, I like that as well. Especially even in the beginning with, you see when his mom goes to the door, there's a photo of her four boys and one of their faces is covered by the little American flag. Yeah, I hadn't picked up on that before, but it's a really nice touch. So you don't know who you're looking for. So you feel like Captain John. (laughs) Yeah, it could be anybody. Yeah, it could be anyone. Any one of these people. It could have been Nathan Fillion. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really nice touch. I, I don't even think that Matt Damon was put on the billing on the poster, so you're not expecting him. You don't know who you're looking for. And I really like it when they do these sort of things in films. Um, mm. I, and I like how they made you sort of think that it was Tom Hanks's character as an old man from the very beginning, because you think Hanks's character survives in the end, and you don't know if he succeeded with his mission. Um, and if they straight up yeah. told you that this is Ryan and he's going to see Miller's tombstone, then that just like, gives oh, away well, everything. They did it. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a brilliant setup and a great uh, use of foregrounding there, where it makes you think that yeah. it's Hanks's character. Um, and I, I think that's it couldn't have been done any other way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, they did great. And I think that's a touching ending there with the old man because. He turns to his wife, I think it is, and says, tell me that I lived a good life. Tell me that I'm a good man. Because after hearing Hank say, earn this, Mm -hmm. you really would be wanting your life to be valuable. You'd be wanting to go home and do something incredible because everything that you did, you never feel like, is this worth it? Is it worth those guys' lives, them coming across the country to come find me? And I think that's such a powerful thing. Even before they find him, Tom Hanks's character says, like, I hope he cures cancer and makes a longer lasting light bulb or something. Like, I hope this Ryan is worth yeah, it. Yeah, I'm just thinking you as Ryan I mean? growing up and having a family, you'd constantly be feeling unsatisfied with your life. And trying to make trying it Trying to make it, trying to earn it. And I like that moment with his wife where at first she's like, what? And then she sees in his eyes, he's like, no, like, I'm serious tell me that what I've done is enough. Mm. And she has that moment with him where there's enough understanding where it's like, you've done well. You know what I mean? Like there's, that's, that's one interaction. You don't see her character any other time. And that one interaction has a lot communicated through it. And I like that his family is there. So, you know, he had a bunch of kids, you know, he, he had a big family. So it's showing that, yeah, he probably, he probably did worth it, but he, but he doesn't feel like he did. Uh, it's an interesting character. Yeah. It's really brilliantly done. I always group films like Saving Private Ryan with things like The Shawshank Redemption and Forrest Gump and Green Mile because there were these epic dramas, a lot of which had Tom Hanks in them, from the 90s. 
and I love these films. I've seen a bunch of these so many times. Um, mm. I'd love to see more of those. I don't know that I could Come put in that, in that category. Um, if someone could like recommend movies that you would put into the same category as those. I don't know. There was a there was a particular feel about these movies, and maybe it was because of the time when I was watching them. It was a I watched no. them all around the same time. Do they have a feel, or am I just looking for things here? No, they do. They were all nineties epics. Mm, these dramas. And the directors you had working at that time, like the nineties, had a lot of really good movies. They really did. You yeah, know, it was the beginning of contemporary movies. And we're starting to have some cool stuff happen again now. But yeah, I think mid to late 90s was actually like a really good time in cinema. Which is interesting because you think of it as being so recent, even though it's not anymore. It's like 30 years ago. Um, or 25. But I'm, I agree with you. There was a certain feel to those movies. I think some of it had to do with... They really hold up. Some of it had to do with the way it was filmed. All of those tended to have really iconic scores. And the directors who were working on them at the time, like we say, that was Spielberg's wheelhouse, basically. Mm. That was his peak and like his time kind of thing. And same with a lot of those other directors. Like Frank Darabont, who did The Shawshank and Green Mile. Yes. It's interesting because in two weeks, we'll be covering The Green Mile, which came out in 1999. Which is arguably the single best year in cinema. It really was. If we actually mm. sat down and looked at the the films that came out in 1999, the top 20 would you would, would have heard of and would love, and they're all great. And then the the week after that, we'll be covering Leon the Professional, which was 1994, which had so many great movies come out as well. Those were two very impactful years, and it's interesting that we're having this conversation now when in two weeks we'll be covering movies from the 90s that really changed a lot of things and inspired a lot of things um and i love having these conversations there were a lot from that time period that kind of just looked at things that were happening in everyday life yeah you know what i mean like, like there was fiction. stuff where you look at <laughs> well mm, but you know what i mean like or they'd have elements of everyday life in it like you just you'd feel like yeah i'm watching a movie but i'm like i relate to that as opposed to the MCU or whatever, where it's aliens and freaking yeah. gods and magic and stuff. You know what I mean? No hate on the MCU, but like you could have something action packed like Saving Private Ryan and still have it be really, really relatable. Mm. You know, we're in a different time now. There's a lot of focus on quip humor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. A, you know? It definitely is a different time in cinema when you're feeling these things. Like the last movie that got d Best Picture was Green Book, and I don't think that that's on the caliber of these. Even the last few Spielberg movies don't feel like they have those elements of humanity and realism and elements that you can relate to. You know, it's interesting. You said they don't have the element of realism, and we're in the age of CGI and like yeah. face capture technology so that's a big part of it is that how could it feel real when everything's being computer animated exactly you're talking about ready player one which is spielberg's last one that was mostly cgi well and even like this we're in this period of disney live action reboots you know what i mean and a lot of them are being yeah. computer reanimated so it's just it's strange i mean a lot of these things were starting around the 90s. There was a lot of remakes and reboots in the 90s, but not nearly to this caliber. They weren't the primary focus yeah. of film, which they are now. That's because sort of Disney's thing. got a mo monopoly on cinema. So we'll see what happens. I think there's some good stuff coming out. It's been a long one, but I think it's good. I like having these conversations. We have been Daniel and Brenton this week. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, check us out on all the socials, and comment on SoundCloud. And until next week, thanks for listening. Okay. Welcome to We Are DB. I am Brenton, joined as always... See, I've blown out again. I always do that. Joined as always by Danielle. That's me. You want to do that again? Oh, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I could feel it. I was like, Bleh. I think there's a plane. I can see a background noise.
There is. I can hear it. And I can see it, too. I'll wait till uh, it's gone. I don't know if it's gonna go. It's definitely applying. It's getting closer, too. It's annoying. Yeah. It's visibly there, so I'm just gonna wait. <clears throat> What is that? Is that a fucking motorbike? Yes. Is he staying in one spot? <laughs> He's on a treadmill. I think we're good enough. It's a Sunday morning, man. Go to church. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> Go to church. <laughs> <laughs>